Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. After reflecting on the question, what's the worst that can happen, today's guest decided to leave a 10-year corporate career behind with a baby on the way to launch an app and podcast helping people level up their mental fitness. He hosts the Keo Conversations podcast and co-founded Keo which in combination reached over 75 million people in the first year. He has interviewed over 100 top performers across various industries to share the mental fitness practices, keeping their minds performing at the highest level. He is also leading new projects with a team from Human to help push health and happiness forward. Welcome to the show, Mark Champagne. Thank you, sir. That first part of the bio now sounds scarier and crazier than, than it did in the, in the past. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, it's, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Um, you know, you're doing amazing work. I got to experience uh, the Keo app and, and know a little bit about you, you know, from the conversations and, and the work you're doing. And I said before we jumped on the show that I loved your congruence and authenticity, building so much value in the space that you're in and doing it from a place of passion and having to do that leap out of the corporate world, right? Where there's security and that, you know, you know, paychecks are coming. It's nice and safe, but you know, you had this inspiration and this passion to do something that you wanted to do that you thought you could help and you took that uh, leap. So um, just kudos for that. So why don't you tell uh, the audience a little bit about yourself and what you're up to? Sure. Thanks, Matt. And I appreciate those kind words. Yeah. So Keo and the, the whole idea for Keo came I want to say a bit randomly, but then in, in retrospect and thinking about, you know, where I'm at now in my life, it, it's not random at all. It's, it all started almost 10 years ago when I first picked up uh, a camera actually and started taking photographs. And for me, that was the first time in my life where I started to notice things or started to slow down and started to see light and photographs, like no matter where I was at. And I share that just because now you know, 10 years or so later, I really feel like that was the first moment of, of when mindfulness actually entered into my life. But then throughout those 10 years, while I was in the corporate world, I started getting up early in the morning and just started reading positive material and trying to fuel my mind um, with good things before the craziness of the day would start. And over the over those years, what was happening, and, and you can probably attest to this as well, like you start following different people and start seeing the content and, and these patterns or these practices start arising. And for me, the one that was the most prominent was journaling or reflective writing. And, you know, years and years of, of this going by, I would just, I'd take, you know, powerful quotes or lines, but more so I'd find these questions that the people were asking themselves and write those down and then see, okay, well, where am I at in my life in, in, you know, in relation to a question like that? And that's how I would, you know, just keep myself going and, and have some sort of guide to the journal and, or journaling, I should say. And what happened was, you know, it, I just really grew frustrated with the, the digital tools that were out there because with that corporate job, I was traveling quite a bit. And for me, uh, A, my writing's terrible. Um, so it's hard to read anything that I was writing and B, I just didn't like the idea of carrying around, you know, extra notebooks wherever I was. And I knew I always had a phone or an iPad or a computer. So, you know, I always had that tool with me or that resource. So for me, I was always doing it digitally and it was just thinking like, okay, you have all these people being interviewed on podcasts and that time writing blogs and stuff. You have this amazing content that we're all seeking. Like, how do you take that content and specifically these prompts that I've been writing down and combine this in a, in a, some sort of guided digital practice, right? Really to demystify the practice. It's not like journaling is new, but you know, even three, the three and a half years that have gone by since starting Keel, like the language has changed, thankfully, but at the beginning, it's just people think about journaling as, oh, the 12 year old girl writing her diary about the boy at school. Right. Whereas what I was seeing was, you know, the Tim Ferriss's of the world and like Ray Dalio and all these different people and athletes obviously is a big one. Um, All of them doing these practices. I'm like, well, what's like, what's the issue here? Why are, why do we have all the stigma around what journaling is when all of these, these people that we admire are doing a practice like this. And that's essentially the, um, the reason why 
um, we started it. That's amazing, man. Well, I totally agree. I've been journaling for a long time and I was actually at Toastmasters today and, and uh, they noticed I was journaling and they asked me to speak about it because there was, there was time and the topic today was habits. And mm. when I was reflecting, that's been a habit that I've had for a long time and there's many benefits to journaling and I'd love to hear you speak on that because you probably have more insight than I do. But one of the things that I like is the idea of um, it's taking the first, it's the first step into physical reality. If you have a mm. goal or you're thinking something through or you're trying to process something, it's in your mind and it's a hamster wheel and things are going and you, you think you may be clear. And then when you write it down, you're really aware of how clear or how fuzzy and confused you are about that concept, that idea, that goal yeah. by what you write. And so I just love to hear your thoughts on why you think journaling is so important and how it can help. Yeah, I think, I think you nailed it, Matt. I mean, I was reading something today um, in a book called Inner Size by uh, John Azareth. And he was talking about just the fact that our mind is like an iceberg, right? And, you know, that the top half is something like three to 5% of our conscious mind. And then everything below the water is our unconscious mind. And I think a practice like journaling just helps us go underwater a little bit and see a little bit more on what's happening there. Like, I don't know about you, but I mean, our, it, it's the, it's a thing sitting on top of our shoulders that literally controls everything, right? Like a lot of people understand the physical world and physical exercise, but your mind's the one, you know, telling you to go to the gym or do the sport or do the training or stick with the training. I mean, our, our mind is so powerful, but I just find that, um, we spend less time on it. And I feel like something like journaling, and then there's obviously a ton of other practices, but journaling for me at least has been a way to get into that and just slow down and kind of go up to that, you know, 30,000 foot view and be able to see the, the play kind of moving a little bit slower. Um, and the other thing I really enjoy about it, because a lot of times people speak about journaling on more of like when you're going through a crisis of some sort, right? And just, just writing it out, which is super powerful. Um, but then there's all these other ways that you can flip it of, okay, well, like, where do I want to be in five years from now? How do I want my life to feel in five years from now? Just going through that, that process or that practice is actually super fun, right? Like there's no rules in that. Just go nuts. And to your point, I, and I've seen this happen, and this is actually how Keo started. I'll, I'll share it in a minute. But when you write that stuff down, it's always amazing when you look at it in retrospect, how much of the stuff, you know, came to fruition. And the example for Kia was I review my, um, my goals and kind of intentions and whatnot every, every December around Christmas time with my father-in-law, just a, like a practice or something. I don't even know how it started, but we've been doing it for years. And the, you know, the year before, we, the, you know, the idea for Keo came up. I remember we were sitting in this little coffee shop um, in London, Ontario, and we're going through everything. And he's like, everything looks great, but your, you know, your vision board and your goals, like there's something that doesn't align there. Like it looks good, but there's something that just doesn't match in that. And we just kind of left it at that. And I had no idea what, what that meant. And that was December. Then come January is when the kind of the, the, the straw was broken. I was like, I'm just so frustrated with how these, how there's a lack of, of digital tools in this space. And I remember pushing my chair back thinking, I'm like, I wonder if this is what he's talking about, you know, cause it, it, there was something inside of me that was just saying, just try this. Like, what do you have to lose? Right. Going back to that original question. And then that's when I flipped an email to actually my brother-in-law, who's the co-founder of Keo and, and just expressed, say, Hey, here's what's going on. Um, here are my frustrations. Do you want to try this thing out? See if we can put something out there to solve these problems and, and see where it goes. Uh, super naively, obviously, as both not being app developers <laughs> or having any idea what it takes to launch an app. But, you know, I wouldn't trade a thing in. We, we, we did it. We got something on the market and we got people using it. And it's been an incredible journey. That's amazing, man. Well, thanks for sharing that, that backstory. It, what this really makes me think about is, I, I don't know if you know the quote, but there's something along the lines where it's the quality of question that you're able to ask that determines your intelligence or the, or, uh, the way you navigate life or something maybe like the smarter you get, the better questions you ask, something along those lines. And I really yeah. believe that. And when you journal or you do self-reflection, 
and you take time to think like when you ask the question, you know, where would, do I want to be in five years or how do I want to feel in five years? That's a question that's very uncommon. People don't think about that. They might think about the cars, the houses, the success, uh, what they'd like to do physically, maybe if they're an athlete, but they're not thinking about how they'd like to feel or, or maybe their friends around there are these different things. And these, these questions will then begin to steer your life. And you have to start with that question. If you don't ask the question, um, you know, you're, you're going to be going in the same direction. And I just uh, interviewed, um, oh, shoot, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Caveat Magister. I think it's like his pseudo uh, writer name. And okay. uh, he wrote a book about Burning Man and the culture of Burning Man. And we're speaking about that. Where at Burning Man, it's interesting because everyone asks you like, you know, what are you doing in the real world? But like, are you happy? Right. It's, it goes, there are very different conversations there because it's such a strange and unique environment, but immediately you want to empower that other person. You're curious, how is your life outside of this? We realize that we're in this temporary city in this temporary space It's very magical, but it opens up to deeper questions. And so often when conversing with people, I was shocked to realize, I said, well, what do you want to do? Like, what would you do if you could do anything? What are your passions? And it has to start with that question. It's not going to manifest immediately, but it's going to start to change the direction of your life by the quality of question that you're able to ask. So, um, yeah, you want to comment on that? I, I do actually, because I, I, it's so important and it's not just one question because I, you know, what, what I'm hearing when you're describing this is, like, you know, as soon as even when we hit, you know, stop on this recording, we go in, out into the regular world, like it, everything's just moving so fast and everything's uh, almost automatically set up that we're on autopilot, right? So there, you know, we have to do something to just slow down and pull out of that autopilot. So when it comes to questions, you know, you can ask yourself one of those questions, but it's almost like you need to repeatedly hear versions of that question's it's over and over again to help break the, the, you know, the autopilot cycle that's happening. And that's, you know, that's where I found doing this kind of stuff every day. It's not like, you know, they, a lot of them, all these questions relate back to gratitude or what's worrying me or things like that. But then when you start hearing in, in, in different light or different words and you hear it from a different perspective, that's when it gets really powerful, right? Like I can ask you, I can leave you with some powerful questions, which, I mean, you'll probably find value with them, but then all of a sudden put like your top three idols that you really idolize in the world. And they ask you the same question. Now, all of a sudden your relationship to that question has changed. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's where I find the magic is. And that, that's what I was hearing, like listening to all these different podcasts. Like I respect that person that's on there. And all of a sudden, it's not like the question is, you know, made up or it's never been asked, but there's different perspective behind it. And uh, you can help, you know, you, you can help yourself evolve through that process and not be limited to just asking the same thing every day. You know, what am I grateful for? What am I grateful for? Um, which is a great place, place to start. But, you know, eventually you roll through my family, my health, you know, the thing in front of me. And then it's uh, now what, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. And when you were sharing that, it just made me think about deepening your level of understanding. You know, in Zen they say uh, some of the universal principles are there are not many. It's just they go deep. You know what I mean? Like non-attachment, things like that. Surrendering. Um, it's a it's a great idea, and it seems easy. But how can you continually to evolve to get deeper to know yourself? And so when you're asking these questions that may be similar, but from a different angle, you're going to have more understanding of that question, but also the reflection and how you perceive it and the lens um, that you're working with, because really ultimately you're understanding yourself more, um, what you want to experience in this life. And those are very important questions. Those are very important things to think about and to reflect on and to take action towards. And so what I wanted to ask is in, working with so many people doing the podcast, what are some of uh, the best questions that you've continually asked? And I'll also say that doing it repeatedly is super important because you're continually steering, you're continually reflecting, and you're telling yourself that this is important. It's important for me to know my values, to know what my intention is, to know what impact that I want to make, uh, to look at my life from an empowering perspective and to keep building on that. That is like, uh, you know, choosing to exercise daily or choosing to um, do practices that are 
empowering you and also creating a connection um, with yourself and spirit and life and however you want to see that. But you're, you're creating reality on purpose, not by default. And on default is kind of like when the world is happening to you and the external circumstance are really yeah. shaping who you are uh, and what you're capable of and what your, poss- you know, what your possibilities are. But when you continue to bring it back on you, it gives you more empowerment to influence your reality, to create your reality, to um, have the courage and inspiration to follow your passions and dreams. Totally. I mean, thinking back to just the questions, um, it's, it's, that's a hard question actually to, to answer just because I'll leave you, I'll, I'll definitely leave a couple, but I mean, every interview that I do, I always ask the guests to leave three reflective questions that at the time in their life are, are circulating the most. And just kind of going back to how this all began, the, the questions that are being left for me have more value in that moment based on what's going on in my life. And then that question will probably fizzle out and something else will come in and it'll make even more sense at that, at that point in my life. So it's hard to, to, to pinpoint because there's literally thousands of them, um, especially within the app at this point. There's, there's, if we include with the user generated ones, there's 200,000 prompts. So there's a lot there. Um, but I think what I've gotten the most out of the interviews and one question that always comes up, and it, it was left by Jamie Wheel from uh, f- the uh, Flow Project, uh, Jamie and Stephen Kotler. Um, and he left this question that just kind of blew me back in my seat and made me think, I had to think about it again. And he said, you know, what in me needs to die so I can move forward? And I just, and then he followed it up. And this, again, the context, I think, is, is what's most important. He followed that question up with a link to nature. And then that's when I really, like, I really started to think about this in a whole other way. Cause if you think about it, right, we have the four seasons and we go through these seasons and, you know, we can't just eliminate winter or eliminate fall without screwing up the whole ecosystem and the whole cycle of, of nature. But when it comes to our own life, you know, we want to kind of hide certain things or not release certain things that may be no longer serving us. And we just kind of pack it in this, this mental room and and don't get rid of it or don't continue the cycle so when he when he left that question uh with the context of nature it it just for me it just changed everything just thinking okay that's you know it's not a bad thing to just step back and think you know what that relationship i'm grateful for it five years ago is it's what i needed but right now it's not um it's not fulfilling my life or it's not pushing me forward so it's okay to let that go right um so yeah, so that's been one of the, the, the questions that, that comes back all the time. And then I would say just the theme that I've learned uh, a lot, you know, in these interviews is just releasing worries or releasing things that, you know, no longer serve you, but then follow that up with what's awesome in your life, you know, and going right down to the details and hitting on all the senses, like visually and, you know, from a smell or, or what you're hearing, like what are the smallest things, just always leaving that process or that practice on a on a great feeling then you just have a a much higher chance of of going back to it because of of that emotion awesome man those are great insights and your follow-up reminded me of just the idea of celebrating the success and i think that Mm. people on on average don't do that very well i definitely don't do that um but when i remember to as a part of like the journaling practice or when i'm going to sleep and look at, you know, what's something that I did uh, that I'm proud of today. You know, when I'm training a lot, I don't think about, you know, whether I ran or I went skateboarding or I did some physical fitness. Um, and, and I see it as just uh, take it for granted. You know what I mean? That that's not yeah. a good thing, but you know, taking care of your body is a good thing. If you did it that day, you can celebrate that. You know, you maybe didn't crush every single thing, you know, on your board, but if you can look at just one or two things that you did, you're also telling your ne- neurology and your way of being that you want to start to look for those things to celebrate those successes because you're going to experience more joy. I think that my mindset and maybe why I do so many podcasts and read so many books on, on personal development is I'm always 
wanting to do better. I'm always wanting to achieve more. I'm always wanting to find the most efficient way. I'm, always, you know, and sometimes that ends up making me kind of stuck and overwhelmed, and it's not a positive thing. Um, but when we can just do a few simple things and celebrate those successes, do you do that as a part of your journaling, or what? What do you feel about uh, what you've learned from the podcast and that idea to just remember to celebrate the success along the way as well? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I was going to comment regardless whether you did or not. (laughs) Because this is something that's personally been probably the most powerful in my own practice. Um, And I call them, you know, just internally, I call this day PhD Fridays. And it's just literally usually around 4 p.m. for me. Um, and and the, the time is important. Like try not to pick a time where you're like rushing out of an, of an office or something like that, or it's too early in the day where you don't feel like, you know, it's the right time. But for me, 4 p.m. works. And I just take 30 minutes every Friday at 4 p.m. I try to go to a spot that I feel good in. Maybe I'm having coffee or tea or drink, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like whatever makes you feel great. And I take 30 minutes to answer two questions. One, what did I learn this week? Or what, what would I have changed this week? And then second, to your point, what was awesome about this week? And, you know, what I love or what I've gotten from this practice, again, is just helping me come out of autopilot. And now I'm going into the weekend. I've stopped the week. I've acknowledged, and, it's, and you know, it depends what systems you're using, but I, you know, I personally use Trello and my calendar for a lot of different things. So I'll look at those things and you're like, holy shit, I actually did a lot of stuff this week and I accomplished a lot of things, right? You know, I did that physical training. I did this. I had this meeting and, and all of that. And, you know, then you can see, right, when you break it down into smaller buckets and that to me you know, if I had any, any suggestion for anyone to start journaling, it would be just start with the, those PhD Fridays or that Friday reflection point. And then you'll want more of that, obviously, and you can start doing it daily. But it's just a great way to, A, answer a lot of questions that we may have. And we have a lot of the answers to our own questions, right? Versus having to seek out more knowledge, more information, just stopping and saying, you know what, maybe I would have handled that conversation a little bit differently for this reason in retrospect, Right. Now, now you're just doing these little micro moments of reflection and learning. So, yeah, I mean, that's what's worked for me. And just going through a lot of, you know, change and, and transition in my own life now, um, stopping and living the present moment as much as possible has been a game changer. And just, you know, stopping the self narrative that's flipping in, in my own mind and just thinking, wow, here we are, like, here I am with you having an awesome conversation. Like this, this is great, right? This is, I'm lucky to be able to have this. That's awesome, man. And there's so many ways I could take this, but I think it's super important. You continue to mention just stopping the autopilot, stopping, you know, I call it the hamster wheel, but you know, we can get in a day that's a hamster wheel or a week or a month or six months or years or a whole lifetime. And we get busy with life and we get into routines and sometimes we were unable to break that pattern. And in hypnosis, they talk about pattern interrupts and, and in psychology mm. and things like that. It's just like to snap you out of that autopilot fog, you know, you could drive somewhere for an hour, sometimes two hours and be like, wait, what just happened? You just <laughs> yeah. zoned out because your body can take care of it. Well, that can happen in a daily process. You could go to work like that, come home and eat your dinner like that, um, not taste your food, you know what I mean? Not not be um, aware or engaged in conversation with your partner. And you're kind of disconnected because you're thinking of something else. And so you're talking about coming back to the present, which is, which is a great idea. And I'm curious, how do you uh, do that? What's What's been something like, do you have a an idea that's helped or you just you're journaling about it more like I found for me when I first read about Zen and all that kind of stuff you're like okay they keep saying be in the present moment square it's a good idea I can deal with that but within two seconds I'm already thinking about something crazy and I you know I didn't even make it a, a, a second so one of the things I started to do was things that I did habitually, that would be a trigger. So going to the bathroom, washing my hands, eating, um, anytime I would go outside, anytime I would go through a doorway at some time, and I would just set that intention at that moment to be as present as possible, um, and then also set an intention. And so with all of these things that I would go through at the day, it breaks it up. And I'm reading um, Psycho-Cybernetics right now, which is such a fantastic book. That guy is awesome. And 
and it just spoke about this and I knew this from sport, but just the importance from resetting. He, he used the example of like, you're, you're going about your day, right? Maybe you're stressed out at work and then you take all that baggage at work into your home and then you yell at your partner and you yell at your kids because you haven't cleared that screen. Oh, and yeah. all you would need to do is just take three deep breaths when you leave work, you know, do a visualization or an intention or just even just three deep breaths, set an intention, get connected to your car. All that stuff's going to be there, but rather than being maybe a hundred out of a hundred or 90 out of a hundred, you will take that down to maybe like a 60 or maybe a 50. And if it didn't go down, you're still at 80, just do another three deep breaths. And that is resetting. That's clearing the slate. So now you can be focused and engaged on some, in something new. Like if you're doing a triathlon and you can't swim and then run at the same time, when you're swimming, you swim and then you run when the next part is there. You know what I mean? You get yeah. the bike when you're out of the water. And so we just take this mind set that's not serving us into new situations all the time totally and i'm glad you brought up um athletics or or just sport because i think it's a good way to just help people visualize how this can be done because i, I mean most people understand just you know intense physical training or if you're training for a triathlon or a marathon or like name your sport whatever it is right um and most people understand that, you know, like it takes a lot of work, right? The physical, the physical and mental, obviously all, all of this training, but then like when you're actually in the vet, like it's that training that gets you to that point, right? So it's not like you're doing new things in the event. It's the months and months and, te you know, technically years worth of training. And I, I view the mind the same way. And it's for me, it's been 10 plus years of every morning for the most part, getting up early because uh, that's what works for me and just, setting up my mind to be able to handle when shit's going to hit the fan, for example, right? So, you know, to answer your kind of original question, I don't think there's one thing for me. Breath work has been really huge in the last, I'd say, six to eight months. Personally, I've been doing a lot of uh, like Wim Hof style uh, breathing and I'm almost like chasing the high of that, of that feeling actually, but I just feel like I, in the day I notice when I'm, I'm doing it right now, I can feel it like sit up and take a, like a proper breath versus the shallow, shallow breathing. So I find, you know, breath work, journaling, meditation. And then for me, if I'm not doing some sort of physical exercise daily, I start feeling it. And I feel like the combination of all of those, um, you know, just inch by inch are just helping me become more self-aware. And that's where, at least for me, I start noticing the pattern because you know in the, in the corporate world because it's really been leveled up obviously in the last three and a half years being so you know connected with this type of work and talking to people like yourself um that i've i've actually noticed when oh like is this am i having anxious thoughts like this this must be what it's all about and i always wonder is it just because i'm more self-aware and these have always been here or is it you know true anxiety of some sort like Frankly, I don't care because I, I'm realizing, oh, something's happening. I need to stop and like recalibrate or reset to your, to your example. And I've noticed this like back in the corporate world, it would get to the point where, you know, my back and neck would start to hurt. And all of a sudden, like, oh, I need to go, you know, get a massage, like something's off versus now it's more, oh, I, I'm starting to feel a little bit tight. You know what? Like what's behind that? Maybe it's, maybe it's mental, maybe it's physical, but like there's something there and realizing it at that point before physically manifesting something that's a, a ma you know a massive problem. So I think I really think all of these practices. I mean, there's so much benefit, but the the core to it for me has just been increasing self awareness. And I have to say, 100% of the 140 or so interviews now that that I've been fortunate to do there's always an element in, of self-awareness or heightened self-awareness with that guest. And they're all coming at it in different ways, but there's usually some sort of relation to the practices because to your point, it just helps you slow down or come off the people mover and, and just be a, even microsecond of a pause in that, you know, whatever the situation is, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to go in that direction and talk a little bit about your podcast because yeah, 140 episodes, congrats. It's huge. It's, uh, it's a lot of effort to do a podcast and you also <laughs> learn a great deal and you get to hear all these amazing people with their different perceptions and their views and their experiences. And when you, when you get to, you know, a hundred episodes, you start to realize, or even if you 
read a whole bunch of books on one subject. You know, your first sub uh, uh, book on self-help will be probably mind blowing no matter what it is. And then after you've read a hundred, you'll notice that there are themes and concepts and, um, and angles that are familiar, you're always going to learn something, but you're going to notice some of those themes. And so what I wanted to ask in, in your own journey, being successful in, in, in transitioning into something you were more passionate about that had more meaning and doing so successfully, 75 million downloads or more is, is incredible. And you're gonna have to transition again. Um, (laughs) and it's a constant flow, but what I was reflecting on before the show was just the congruence that when I went into the app, you could see that some people get into the self-help space and spirituality space because there's business in it now. It's now it's popular. That's not a bad thing. It's good to be in that industry, but you can usually see when someone's doing it for the right reasons and how that little extra work is putting in and how they're trying to find information and have that lifestyle. Like an example would be, you know, you could make a product that's like four, four minute abs, you know what I mean? And this product could be good or crap depending. And they said, just use this product and that'll solve all your problems. Well, if you're still eating Kentucky fried chicken and drinking two gallons of pop a day, that's probably not going to help with the actual intention of improving your overall health. And so that's long winded to just say that you can see within the app, within the podcast and with the resources and the way that it's structured, that it is designed to help you and also give you more resources so that you can continue your education, that you can continually empower yourself and educate yourself. And so uh, kudos for that. And just what have you, what have you learned as far as just like all these amazing guests how do we live a life where we can have the courage to just shape our dreams, to be a little bit more joyous, to have a human experience that we're proud of, that we enjoy, and maybe some of the common problems that people face? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and just 75 million app store impressions. I wish there were downloads, but oh, okay. those, are, those are eyeballs. Um, okay. <laughs> we've got about nearly 200,000 or so downloads, which I mean, still our benchmark was zero. So we're pretty grateful for that. Um, I think what, what I've been picking up is just like two things. One, th- th- this journey that we're on, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of it in the short term, then it's just going to be miserable in, in some capacity, right? And that all of this stuff takes time. I mean, we're, we're talking, it's been almost four years since uh, the original idea of, of Keo came about. And, uh, you know, you allude out, and I'll explain later, you alluded to some transition, but it took four years to realize, you know, or to go down a path of seeing, okay, here's something we created that was like a scratch your own itch scenario. It went out, our benchmark was zero. And all of a sudden there's people coming in organically. I'm like, wow, this is, this is pretty wild. Like now, our purpose shifted to, okay, well, let's create a small little team and see, you know, if we can put something of quality and keep this going. And then it really quickly shifted to, wow, you know, from these interviews and interacting with all these people, practice like this literally has saved lives. Like now we're talking a whole other level. And and that's, that's actually where we're at today with, with the whole app is that, yeah, we've reached a lot of people. Um, the network that's been built, the content that's been built, the number of questions and the people using the product is, is increased and it's, it's awesome. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's an actual business and that it can sustain itself because as much as um, we want to help as many people as possible, I mean, we also you know, have to put our own oxygen mask on first, right? Or we're, we can't help anyone. And um, so for, uh, for us on the Keo side, we actually recently made the decision to pull the actual app off the market and we'll keep the podcast rolling and there's some other things in the works. Um, and that was a tough decision, um, to, to do that. But a reason I'm sharing this is it loops into like, that's the first part of the journey. And now I'm working with this, you know, this awesome team, um, uh, run by the uh, company called Human, and it's another digital journal called Jour, full of questions. There's 190 or so thousand people in there, and you know I get the opportunity to continue this path and take everything that's been learned for the last three and a half, four years with Keo, and apply that with a team that might be further advanced on an element or in a certain way or has a different mindset that we can hopefully then reach more people in in a faster way. I think that's key because we're playing with the idea of that, you know, these are people's minds and people, you know, I'm obviously speaking in extremes, but when people are taking their life from mental health, like it doesn't have to be this way. And, you know, this is one practice to help. There's obviously a ton of other solutions um, that can help, but 
this is our wheelhouse. And, you know, there was, I think, a lot of self-reflection on my own part to, to say, to let ego go, right? Is this, is this a failure? Um, you know, I, I can call myself a founder of something, right? Uh, versus how can I continue and take what's, what's been built and keep it living on in some capacity that will ultimately kind of push, you know, happiness and fulfillment to more people in the world. And, and that's, that's where we've all kind of settled at this point. So uh, I don't even remember the, the original question at this point, but I mean, the kind of the long-winded statement I'm, I'm trying to leave here is that you just don't know how that path going to turn out. I don't, I didn't know when I left my stable kind of corporate job that I'd be talking to you and it would have been four years going down this new path. And that now I'm very, like, I can feel that I'm doing the right work. And it's, it's just how you and I met. I mean, you know, when you have these introduction calls and they're, they're flowing that, wow, you're doing the right thing when the right people start showing up almost organically. And I didn't know that four years ago. This, it was more of, uh, let's just try this because I'll have a regret not trying it. But now it's, I have to do this work. And, you know, the vehicle's changing a bit on what we had started, but not really. I mean, it's, it's just contributing to the whole journey of this, um, in, in my case, journaling and helping people with their mental fitness. Wow, man, <clears throat> that's a really beautiful answer. And I appreciate you sharing all that. It's so interesting because again, when we're, we're chatting and I was learning more about Keo and, and the success. So 200,000 users is, that's incredible. That's massive, massive success in, in that number. But it's interesting how sometimes that doesn't help with finances. It doesn't help for you to pay the bills and, you know, put food on the table for the kids. And it's just like, huh, how do I do this? And how do I continue to do what I'm passionate about, but also have to redirect. And I think that there's a, there's a big amount of humility there too, right? Because you have to kind of surrender to the way things went. And when we were chatting, I was like, it's like you are building a foundation on bricks. We yeah. start to move towards our passion. You know, you take a shot and you, you had a reasonable amount of success. You added so much value to it and you got to a point and now you're kind of letting it adapt. And this is, maybe an element of, of spirit or the universe or nature just assisting with the environment and other humans and other people who are shaping things in a different way. And how can you collaborate and say, okay, you know what, for my intention to help people, this will be the best move. This is the best yeah. move for uh, the company, for the intention and for my life. And so you would have had to take the first steps and all of those other things and everything that you learned and all those trials and errors to get to that space. And then when you go through that phase, it's going to be the same thing because you don't know for sure how it's going to work out, but you're better able to know if you're on the path by how you feel, the people yeah. you're meeting, the experiences you're having, what you're starting to work towards. You know, when you wake up every single day and, you know, maybe you, your job is, I don't know, let's just say just to beat people with a stick, you know, and you go to a certain job and you grab that stick and you go with a whole bunch of other people and you beat them with sticks. It's a hypothetical job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're like, you know, I don't want to beat people with sticks anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something else. And you start to gravitate into new situations. Maybe you start planting trees. You know what I mean? You become number one apple farmer in the world. Who knows? Um, but the, the bottom line of this ridiculous metaphor is that even though, like, I don't think it's possible when you're moving in a direction of like your passions and dreams that you know, like the final goal. Sometimes when you're an athlete, you know, you want to be a world champion, things like that. But when it has to do with like heart centered passions, it's more a direction, you know, when yeah. you hit like, it's like you're in the middle of the ocean and your direction, it hits these little islands along the way, these little experiences, these different things. And so you have to take those steps to get to the next step so you can build on that inspiration. And so I want to ask, what is like the highest vision for what you're working on now? What would you like to see happen? How do you see that, that it can help people and impact people? I, I mean, I love how you position that. And this just whole idea of kind of the end goal or this path, right? I mean, I think it, it's hard to see it. And I've done a lot of, you know, I've done a lot of kind of deeper or inside work myself recently on this. And I don't, I don't know what the end goal is. What I've learned a lot over the last few years is just really living the actual journey that like I'm in now, right? And, and that's the actual 
that's the value of, out of all of this. All into your point of, of just pointing in the right direction. As long as you feel like you're, you're pointed in the right direction. And if you're not, then you know, that's another thing I've picked up quite a bit from these interviews is just keep trying, right? Keep trying. If there was one thing I would have done when I was younger, I think I would have talked to a lot more people and just networked and uh, not in, you know, in a sense of trying to get jobs and things like that, but just find really interesting people. And it almost sounds, basically it's a podcast. So find really interesting people and talk to them. Right. And cause like you get so much out of that um, and you can experiment. Right. And then all of a sudden when something clicks, cause I didn't know when I, when I left my job, I didn't know that, that this was going to be the thing. And because I was happy doing what I was doing, like it wasn't one of those scenarios of, I can't wake up another morning and go into work. That, that wasn't my scenario. So I guess for me, just to answer your question though, um, like I'll feel really great if I can contribute to a team and whoever that panel of people, um, includes that where we can put mental fitness on the same table as physical fitness and have it as accepted and integrated into people's lives as, Hey, I'll meet you for dinner, but I'm going to go for a run first. Right. Um, I'll meet you. I'm just going to, you know, do a quick meditation. It's coming like that. Just in even the last three and a half years, especially meditation. I mean, I give all the big meditation companies, apps, people, anyone talking in that space so much respect because they've really uh, opened up um, mainstream discussions. Journaling, I feel is probably two or so years behind that, but it's also even in the last three and a half years, I've gone from saying the word journaling to, you know, from, reflective writing or reflection you know before I was I wouldn't say the word because it would just shut down the conversation and, and I have to work my way up to it so it's been comforting to see the evolution but yeah for me Matt is really just being able to have impact on a global scale and and really bring this to people that need it and change the narrative around what these practices are and how people are speaking about them um, and that's why I really like the word or terminology of, of mental fitness and just taking the umbrella approach of mental fitness is, is mental health and is performance and is visualization includes all of that stuff. That's beautiful. It's so awesome. And it's right along lines with, with the intention with the Zen athlete book. And, and the idea with that is, is to put mental training on par with physical training when you train kids. You know, it's, it's such a simple initiative and so profoundly important and life changing. You know, we talk about reframing it to mental fitness. So it's not as, uh, let's say woo woo or out there. And I think like practices like meditation, when you put journaling in there, certainly with the podcast that I've done about 300, um, almost all the guests and a lot of guests particularly said, you know, I was like, well, what was the change for you? Right. And a lot of times it came from journaling. They had an experience and then they wrote about it and then they kept writing about it. And so journaling was a common denominator along many, many people's success. You know, I would say 95% or higher. And it's such an important attribute, just like uh, running or physical fitness or something like that. When you add it to your life, it, it can have a very profound effect. It might seem simple. It might seem trivial. It might not seem as, as empowering as, as you think it is, but it's one of those things like meditation or running or taking care of your body or, you know, cleaning up your diet that will have a profound impact. And right now in the world, we are facing a lot of issues with uh, teen suicide, with um, depression, with anxiety, with all of these different things. And we're really, as a culture, promoting and advocating for medication and things that aren't really getting to the root of the problem. You know, if you're, you know, a, yeah. a 12 year old kid and you weigh 200 pounds, the problem probably isn't, you know, um, you, you know, a pill is going to fix that. You're going to have to get the kids some exercise and some education. Yeah. And so from your podcast, I'm curious, what have you learned around uh, just the idea of moving from just a, disempowered depressed or anxious state into an empowered enthusiastic passionate state and also the transition from fear into more confident those two themes i find yeah pretty much uh anywhere and 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 always good to have a little bit more insight on those ideas to totally so i you know i'll start with the fear because I, it's something that 
I found has worked really well for me just journaling about this because, and, I, and I'm actually writing some content on this for, for the team at Jura right now. Um, and it's just around the notion of these looping narratives that we create in our mind. Right. And again, it's just filling that, that mental room um, with all this stuff that technically for the most part has not come to fruition yet and probably never will. But the damage of, of thinking about those things over and over again is just so vast and so huge that, you know, it, it throws us in this, this anxiety loop. Right. Whereas, you know, if you, if you can throw in a practice like journaling and, and, and the other practices, again, help you stop and just take a moment to pause, but journaling, at least what you can do is just, okay, what is worrying me? Right. And start listing that stuff out. Just doing that has helped right? Oh, okay. I've, I've released what I'm thinking about. It's on a page or in an app or however you're doing it. And that's the other thing that I've been really talking a lot about. And I'm glad you kind of brought it up in your, your last comment, but just the notion of journaling, I think there's a lot of people doing it in its kind of uh, stereotypical way, but I'd argue almost everyone's doing it if you kind of shift the definition. And I shift the definition to just flat out reflection you know, if you're walking down the street and just thinking about something, I mean, essentially, you, you don't have to write that down, but you're reflecting on things and it's a type of journaling, right? Or you're just experiencing things. But the key is to, is to slow down a bit and, and actually do that thinking, right? So, you know, if you can do that and then just write out those worries or think, you know, like, what is it that's really worrying me? And then the next step, like, what is in my control? Like, now we're getting into kind of like stoic philosophy here, but you know, like what are the controllable elements and what's completely outside of my control and just, you know, start releasing this stuff bit by bit, right? I, you know, I can't control that. So stop, you know, just stop worrying about that or focus on the one or two things I can control. And then again, 90 plus percent, I'd say of the time, none of this stuff comes to uh, real life, right? But we've looped for, you know, in some cases, potentially years, right? Around the self narrative. So I think, you know, it's a good way to just go through that practice and just stop it. First of all, acknowledge it, stop it, release what is bothering you. And then again, looping back almost to how we started this conversation, but then following all that up with, you know, what am I grateful for? Or like, what's great in my life right now? What, what can I really appreciate that's in front of me right now? Right. It may, might be just enjoying like a really good quality cup of coffee that, you know, that's your thing. Right. Thank you for that. And then that, that just shifts it immediately. I think it's Tony Robbins that says this, like you can't be grateful and upset at the same time. So it's just one of those, those quick tricks that you can, you can use at any point. It's free and um, so powerful. That's a really great answer. I love that. And feel free to go into stoic philosophy whenever you wish. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's again, the, the answer is so simple and even for me doing the podcast and reading a lot of books, I sometimes forget how simple that is and just writing it down, seeing it visually. And then what is understanding what is in your control? Because when you see it, you have more understanding before you didn't, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like this energy that's holding you back and it's frustrating you and causing all kinds of problems. And yeah. it's interesting because it is the mind that's creating these problems. It's the mind that's creating stress, anxiousness, anxiousness, fear, a doubt, worry, you know, like there, there are real things in our environments that can cause us to be stressed, but most of it, you can have a much more empowering perspective around that. Um, I, I heard about this story. I, I don't know. I, I think it's true anyway, because I was at Burning Man, but it was one of the most fascinating stories I've heard. But uh, I was at a wedding at Burning Man once. Oh, and, wow. And uh, the, the best man was speaking about his brother, right? So he was his brother and he goes, my brother is always, uh, he was a younger brother. He's like, my brother's always impressed me and, and been my role model. But a few years ago, he did something that um, blew my mind. You know, he was in the kitchen and he, the guy was a young, successful entrepreneur. He's a very nice guy, really great overall human being, uh, had, a, had a successful business. I think it was around 30 something. And so his brother said he was in the kitchen and he was really stressed out you know he was just like so upset and he just he goes he looked at me and he goes you know what i'm never going to be stressed out again and he goes since that day i haven't seen him stress out about anything 
ever since. Wow. And, it's, and it's so I really wanted to talk to the guy after, but it, like it shocked his brother. And then I thought like in the moment, I was like, is it possible to just drop stress? Is that, yeah. you know, because you think about those Zen stories about uh, non-attachment and things like that, you know, it's probably possible. It'd be very challenging, but maybe not to that degree. Maybe let the really stressful things stress you out a bit. But even from a stressful state, let's just say um, you're in a disaster situation. You're like a, a wildland firefighter, which I, I coached one for a while. Really, really awesome guy. Shout out, Tom. I should be writing a book soon. We were working on a book together. and Well, he was working on a book and I was like, yeah, bro, write that book. And uh, <laughs> He, Cause he was talking about anxious. He's a very anxious guy. He would say. And um, so there's an anxious guy going into wildland firefighting situations. That is a situation yeah, yeah. you should be anxious in. Right. But for him to perform at his best, he can't go in there anxious. That's, that's when you're going to have an issue. You got to be able to perform at that space at that time from a much more empowered state. And so being in those states of anxiousness or depression aren't empowering states to move you to a new understanding, a new feeling, and a new circumstance. So um, we need to learn how to navigate those. And it's totally possible to even shift a degree. You might not go from depression to overwhelmed enthusiasm and joy, but you can maybe go from debilitating depression to somewhat depressed. Yeah. I mean, I have to share an example. And then obviously, if there's any astronauts listening, please reach out. But <laughs> when, when you mentioned your story about the firefighter, like Chris Hatfield in his book, he talks about their training. And because the reason I want to bring this up, because I, I think it is possible to eliminate stress, but it also that, it, let me caveat that, because the way I see that is when you say something like that, it's like, it is possible, but it's also it is possible to run and you know participate in an ultra triathlon, but it's going to take a hell of a lot of work, you know. <laughs> so I think it is possible, but and when it comes to someone like a, an astronaut or like Chris Hatfield's example in his book, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like they're so trained up mentally that when they're up there, and I think in his case, something happened where um, he had a tear or something form in his eye while he was you know, had his suit on, he was out in space. And like, that is like a life and death scenario up there, given the zero gravity and all of this. And what, what, what he was able to do was keep his heart rate at like a, a, I think a resting heart rate of 55 or something like that. Like, like something low that normally, you know, you go into this mode, basically he's short circuiting his, like his actual biology or physiology that normally we'd go into this panic state. Right. So it's possible in these, in these cases where, you know, you look at an astronaut like that, where it's literally a life or death situation. Um, but it takes the work for sure, right? It takes, takes the daily training, just like you would for your, your body uh, with your mind, but then you, you can start seeing these results. I'm not there yet, but <laughs> uh, you know, that's why they're called practices, but I'll shoot for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good example. And I think that that's a really important thing to kind of stress is that it can be it can come from process. I think that it is possible just to maybe drop stress and anxiety immediately. It's possible. So we'll give you that. Like maybe for some. So if you have the like the four minute mile, but most of you will probably have to work for it for training. And it made me think of another example. I actually, when I was in um, Guatemala, I did this morning hike. And uh, so we're going to go do the sunrise. So we're going through this jungle, uh, you know, four in the morning. And I felt like there's something behind me. And I look behind me and it's pitch black, can't see anything. And um, <clears throat> then we, we go another minute in, I look behind me again because uh, I hear some footsteps and there's a gun pointed at my head, a huge uh, pistol, like <laughs> this thing is oh, a big man. gun. And so I look at this thing, I look at the guy and there's two guys behind him. There's one and there's two other ones, right? My immediate reaction, my, my heart rate didn't go up. Nothing happened. I, I, I don't know if this is the smartest thing. It seems like a stupid thing to do. I just turned around and kept walking. I just completely ignored the situation. I kept, walk, I kept walking. Um, and I'll have to explain a little bit after. But, so I kept walking. And then they were probably confused. They ran up. And then um, so I look behind them again. Right. I look at the guy. The gun is in my face. The two men are there. Right. I ignored them again and i just turned around and kept walking and so i because i was the last person in the line everybody else was in front of me and so they start walking up again and they make like saying stuff now everybody at this time 
is aware of the situation. I look back, the guy's waving the gun in the round saying like, get down, get down, you know, waving the gun. I look to my left at this point now, everybody's on the ground and I'm still standing up. <laughs> so I was like, so I look back, now he'd taken a step back, shoots the gun in the air. So it's a real gun. And then I'm like, oh shoot, I should probably get on the ground. I get down on the ground, keep my eye on the guy. The, the two other guys start trying to get all people's stuff, right? They go to the end of the line. They kick our guide, um, sh tell him not to move. I think they shoot the gun one more time. I don't know. I have to read my uh, notes from the story that I wrote after that. And then they leave. Um, the reason why I share that story is because I've trained martial arts my whole life. Ideally, in that situation, I do a sweet Bruce Lee karate kick, yeah. and you know what I mean. I do something real amazing, and and I defend. I get that guy with the gun, and I take the other two guys out or whatever. And if there's anyone else, I kick their butt. But that response, how ridiculous it was, um, is something that my body chose to do for whatever reason. It was kind of like, you know, and I've gone through this process. It was just a result where like. If you go head to head and you go at the gun, then maybe you get shot by turning away. It's like calling his bluff. And does he want to commit murder, you know, to get somebody's cell phone? Um, but also it's a pattern interrupt. He, they wouldn't have known how the hell to process that. They'd be like, yeah. this is one crazy son of a gun. Like what yeah. the hell? And so that's why the first time it took them a while to follow up because they'd be like, what kind of response is that? <laughs> And so um, it's, you know, I, again, I don't know if you ever get in that situation. Now, if it were different, if, if my body and my mind would have observed different things, I might've acted in a different way. I had been in, in troubling situations before where the response is totally different, but I didn't choose that. I didn't go through all the options in my mind and say, I'm just going to ignore this guy who's pointing a gun at my head. My body just did it. And so I, I thought that that was so fascinating because I didn't make that choice. It was just how my body of all the options I could do just did that. And so it's a long winded story to say that, you know, when Chris Hadfield was up in the, up in, you know, in space and he, he had that issue, he was able through training to, yeah. to choose the emotional response. But in life, when we're doing flow state, writing a book, um, choosing our career, doing all these different things, when you have the training and you build those skills, when it comes down to those points in time where you need to perform or get into flow state or anything like that, the body is going to take all of that knowledge and put it together. You know, in reading psych Psycho-Cybernetics, it talked about, uh, I forget who it was, it was an Olympic diver, Greg Luganis, and he would visualize 40 times before doing the jump, right? And yeah. that's just one mental practice. So we didn't go up there if you're going to learn a new trick and just go do it, right? You, there'd, be, there'd be trampoline training. There's all these processes you could do so the body could just react. So that's super long-winded. I want to give it back to you for any comments. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add to that other than I, I think there's, there's so many different examples of, uh, especially in the, like the sports world, right, of just – you it's your training before then it just puts you in this like you're i'm a big mountain biker and it's like i'm not going to discover a new set of legs on the trip like it's the spinning and the work on the bike before that's going to get me through that that experience right so you know no different with the mind and i just what i love about it it's almost limitless right there's so many things like when you start journaling or if you start meditation or breath work like whatever it is right like sound healing like pick your pick your practice like something that works for you then all of a sudden just this whole other world opens up right and it's just there's so many different things to try and it just feels like you're just continually evolving and evolving and evolving. You're becoming more self-aware. You're like, wow, I can handle a situation like this that I, I couldn't have imagined handling, you know, three or four years ago. And it just keeps going like that. So that's what really lights me up about all of this stuff. And I'm super excited that it's starting to be accepted mainstream. I mean, I think it's unfortunate, you know, part of the reasons we're in a bit of a crisis, obviously from a mental health standpoint. And there's, obviously so many different uh, reasons for that. Um, but it is exciting that people are talking about this and that it's, it's being incorporated into people's lives and companies are picking it up and, you know, they're picking it up, not from the sense of just, you know, return on investment, but like they realize that happy people are a good thing or healthy people are a good thing. And like I've seen that evolve with so, just in the last few years with some of the bigger companies like LinkedIn and stuff like that. So 
yeah, I'm really optimistic. I mean, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, but we're all out here helping each other. I mean, even flipping it right back to this, you know, the team over at Jure, when they launched the app, I mean, the founder and I got on the phone immediately, like, welcome to the space. Like, we're all here. This is not a, oh my God, you're taking market share. Like, how do you put a market share on, on people's health and, and their their happiness, right? Like, let's work together. There's there's plenty of, of room here for us all to survive. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just pumped to have found this space and, you know, put me in front of people like yourself and work together on all this. That's amazing, man. Well, you're a beautiful example of, uh, there is no competition. There's only collaboration. And, you know, I love that. I, I love that idea because when you go into that spirit, you are finding like-minded people and like-minded initiatives. And if we do want to make a big positive change and we're serious about that, it's going to take collaboration, you know? Yeah. And, and so everybody counts, everybody matters and their life matters. It doesn't matter if you're the founder of the company or, you know, or whatever the case is, like you just remain humble and you help how you can, when you can, um, with who you can. And it's so yeah. much better to do it with each other and it's so much better to do it in an environment where people actually care about you and it would be great if companies and corporations think that way you know think that they they value the human being you know they value that process they'll be better workers and i think that the conversation is changing and it is important and it's great like people are like you are out there doing your part to say, hey, you know, there's a million paths to the way home. The idea is how can you be more mindful? How can you be more healthy? How can, what, what do you do so you're not stressed, you know, like crazy, you know, can we help you get to an optimal state? Like these, these are things that work for me, what works for you and, and exploring those, those conversations because we're all going to have more awareness. The, the person who comes from complete stressed out will make a faster transition because of all the people neandering their way over there you know yeah. I, I still neander with it i get upset all the time you know <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah, same. Like I'm, not, I'm not perfect at this at all <laughs> but i'm i'm giving it a good shot and and i'm trying to help when i can so you know i really think that your work is important and, and great and i think you're a, a very positive example on many fronts on what it what it means to be a conscious entrepreneur what it what it means to um think about something that has meaning uh, have the courage to try it and then also the willingness to adapt and, uh, you know, embody a lot of, of great skills and great intentions and to, to live it. You know, there's a lot of people uh, in this space and in other spaces that are doing it just for profit and that's okay. They can do that. I'd rather that they try to profit yeah. in this space, if any space. And if you can do it from a space of congruence, then that's even better. Do it because you want to and you, and you feel something about it and you're trying to make a difference. So thank you for, for doing that, man. Um, is there anything that you wish that we had talked about or anything that you want to um, share with the listeners before we close it up? Oh, well, thanks for that opportunity. Um, I, I mean, I think we covered a lot, which is great. This was really fun. Um, I think the only thing just for, for anyone listening, you know, you, you mentioned it just a minute ago, but I, I don't think there's really a prescription for any of these practices. It's not like, hey, you have to get up at five o'clock and meditate and do this every day. But I would encourage everyone listening to just find, you know, that one thing right? And just, just try something. Maybe it's just a couple breaths when you first get up and, and set an intention for the day, but like whatever it is, just try something and, and stick with it for a bit because it's, there's just so much, I feel like we're sitting on these hidden superpowers is, is how I feel about this. And I just, you know, even though I've been journaling for 10 plus years, you know, it's only really been the last few years where I've picked up all these other things. And I'm like, man, it's not, again, none of this stuff is new, right? Like it's just, we're talking about them in, in a different narrative that are, that's resonating with people. So, you know, for me, it's like, oh man, I wish all of the, these things were here, uh, you know, 10 years ago or even before that. So yeah, uh, my, my kind of party message is just, you know, try something new, try something new tomorrow or today, whenever you're listening to this and uh, just be open to these new practices because there's just a ton of joy and uh, endless amount of benefit that can come from them. Awesome, man. Well, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. I, I've enjoyed exploring all these topics and I'm a fan of your work and your podcast. Where can people find more about you if they want to connect or, or where should we send them? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'll pop some of this in the show notes, but I mean, I'm uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Actually, I have to say I have found a really nice podcasting network on there. I think it's like a really underutilized social network. Uh, so you can find me there, Mark Champagne. Look for the guy with the gray hair. I'm the, I'm the young old man. Um, you can find uh, you can find Keel app the podcast on Instagram. You can find Jure there as well if you're looking for some a couple different solutions for uh, journaling and just mental fitness discussions. Um, and stay tuned for a new podcast as well with Jure. We're looking at uh, expanding some conversations around behind the the human and what's going on. Just again to to really expand this conversation around mental fitness. So so stay tuned. Amazing, man. Well, thank you for all your work and your contribution. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for coming on the show. Amazing. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Peace.